I live to worship him. No, 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 no. No, no, no. You got to go to work. I'm not saying you got to walk around your job all day. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Pastor. Oh, but in the depths of your soul, oh, yeah. there's a praise that just builds up. Every now and then, you got to steal away to the bathroom and just tell him, I want to say prayer. thank you because you've been mighty good. Is that all right? Come on, join me for a quick moment of prayer. Father, we honor you. We are submitted in this moment. Have your way in this place. I pray, God, that you would hide me behind the cross, that they will see none of Riola, but all of you. Take the brakes off, God. This is your house. We are your people. So have your way. God, you know the constraints and the issues that, I, that are before me. I release myself into your hands. And I thank you in advance because your credit is good with us. This is our sincere prayer in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. People of God said amen. Amen, amen and amen. amen. Come on, would you join me very quickly as we rest on our feet? We're going to the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 22. You can stay right there if you want to for a little while, just while, just while I read. It's all right. It's soothing to my soul. I see why Saul called for David to come and play, because it'll just soothe. Y'all ain't going to help me in here. It'll just soothe your soul. I, 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 Sister Char, Sister Char I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a prude, but I understand what Pastor Jenkins was talking about this morning. I like all kinds of music, but see, the problem with, with, with Wayne and Wale and Future and even Bruno Mars, who I like very much, the problem with it, they can excite me, but they can't soothe me. Come on, now. See, that's why we got to watch what we let come into the portals of our ears because there's some stuff that can tantalize your flesh. But there's some other stuff that'll touch your soul. Is that all right? Ooh, I feel him in this place. Come on, go with me to Genesis chapter 22, starting at the first verse. Genesis 22 and 1, if you have it, say amen. amen. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham... And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his, his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. You ought to be shouting right there. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, 
in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. For the few moments that we have, as the Lord would give us utterance, we like to speak from the thought, the cornerstone of the family. The cornerstone of the family. Sister Shelton, as the Lord would have it this month, we are going to focus on the family. Our preaching series is entitled Focus on the Family. It is for this simple fact. We, have, we live in a society where we are focused on many things. We are focused on what 45 is doing in Washington and what's happening in North Korea. We are focused on what the stock market is doing. We are focused on what Beyonce and the twins are doing. We've got lots of focuses, but, but we've lost some focus on the family. Yeah. And the challenge with that is when we, when we lose sight of the family, we lose sight of a fundamental unit that is at the core of the success of society. Right. We, we, we believe the fact that a strong family makes a strong church. And a strong church makes a strong community, and a strong community will make a strong city, which will make a strong commonwealth, which will make a strong a country, but, but without a strong family, that unit is in trouble. And, and, and at the cornerstone of that unit, known as the family, is something called a father. I, I know, I know, Deacon Artist, that it's, it's no longer popular to, to talk about fatherhood and, and to talk about the place of a man in, in the family because, because we have adopted society's view of the family. Right. Society would tell you that now for a family it could just be the single mother. And let me pause right there and suggest that the single mother, in my opinion, is one of my greatest heroes. She is asked and required to do that which was not required or not expected of her in the first place. Right. It is unfair for one to do the job of two in this day and time. And it, 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 let me be clear, I don't know how a single mother or a single father does it, but it does not negate the fact that according to the text, yes. that the family is made up of a man yes. and a woman. And they are to be fruitful and multiply. I ain't scared, so let me go on and say it like I feel it. Society would tell you that you can have a family with two daddies and two mamas and children. And I can't deal with what society says. But God said, y'all ain't going to go with me. I wish I had some Bible believers in here. God said they ought to be a man and a woman. And they are to have a family. But can I be honest with you? We have gotten to the place that this unit called the family, which is gonna make a strong church, which will make a strong community, which will make a strong unit and a strong commonwealth and country, the cornerstone, which is the man, is being etched out slowly but surely. Before you can say, before ladies you get in a tizzy, don't, don't worry, this might not be your Sunday. This Sunday we're gonna talk about men as the cornerstone. But next Sunday, we're going to talk about mama, which is the backbone. Y'all just stay. If y'all say amen this week, I'm going to come get y'all next week. Is that all right? Please understand that, that a cornerstone, uh-huh, uh, a cornerstone is, uh, I lost it. Here it is. it is. It is an essential part, the chief foundation on which something is constructed or developed. So, so, so when we say that the father is the cornerstone of the family. It is to suggest that he is the foundation of which everything else is to be built. And you can take issue with that, but you don't believe my Bible. Because the first family was started with the foundation of the man. Y'all ain't gonna go with me today. God makes a man and he tells him I want you to name everything that I made. If I had time, I'd deal with the fact that part of our problem as men, as husbands, and as fathers is we have negated our responsibility to name what God gave us. And I'm not just talking about your children, but you ought to name the blessings that God has given you. You ought to name the responsibility he has given you. And quit letting other people put names on your stuff. 
The man is the foundation of the family. Used to be daddy and granddaddy. Went off to work. Worked all day. Came home. Brought the check home. Had dinner at the table with mama and the children. And, and they were an integral part of the unit. But now, uh, daddy can be a rolling stone. <laughs> and, and don't get it twisted. I didn't come to man bash this morning. Uh, be, because as much as there are some that are rolling, there are some that are the cornerstone. But the text will help us understand that, that it is essential for the man to be the preeminent part of the family unit as he was called by God. Um, um, here's this thing about family that I want us to understand. Family, there are, there's the identity of the family. There are the implications of family. And there are the imperfections of family. And I need you to understand that, that we have to identify what God says our family is. And the implication of that is there ought to be a safe place, a sanctuary that we can always go back to. It's nothing like being able to go back to where your family is. Nothing like going to go where some folk that love you and care for you and accept you just for who you are. But please understand the family is imperfect. And I know you can't say amen in here because you have the, you, you have the, 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 the masquerade that you got a perfect family, but, but all families got some stuff. From the first family to the last family, there's some imperfections with family. And I can choose my friends, but I can't choose my family. And some of my family is jacked up from the flow up, but can I tell you something? They still my family. Do I have anybody in here that says, no matter what, we're still family? Here we are in the text. I got to go. I got about seven minutes, so y'all got to catch it quick. In this, in this narrative that is very familiar in your hearing, we will find a man by the name of Abraham. Abraham is the cornerstone of his family. I got Bible for that. God tells him at 90 years old, you will be the father of many nations. God, how am I going to be the father of many nations when I have no children? And 10 years later, the Lord brought to pass exactly what he promised. That's a good word, Fleming, for somebody that's been mad because the Lord didn't show up 10 minutes ago. If you learn to wait on the Lord and be of good courage, he will bring you what he promised. Abraham and Sarah are promised something and the Lord blesses them with, with a baby by the name of Isaac. I don't have time to deal with Ishmael because if I did, I'd talk about the cornerstone of your family means you can't settle for less. Because he ends up with Ishmael, which was not the promise, before he gets the blessing, which was Isaac. If I had time, I'd tell a brother, just wait on the one that God sends you. And don't wait on the one that will drop it hot for you. Y'all ain't gonna help me in here. I'm trying to make you understand that if you're gonna be the cornerstone of what God ordained, then you've got to do it God's way. By the time we get to the 22nd chapter, some stuff is going on. God tells Abraham to go to a place where I will show you. And here's what I want us to walk away understanding. That sometimes when you become the cornerstone, um, um, you've got to learn that what you have to offer is for the good of the family. You, you've got to understand that there's some lessons that can only be taught by the father. So, so, so what does this text teach us? The, uh, the first thing the text teaches us is that the father um, has to teach about the presence in family. Uh -huh. right. Reggie, I'm in the text. Um, um, Abraham uh, takes off as the Lord has told him. He'll show him a mountain that he'll, that he'll show him. And the text says that, that as they go, it's Abraham, it's Isaac, and two servants. Yeah. And when God reveals the place where they're going, Abraham says, you all stay here. Uh -huh. Me and the boy are going forward. Yeah. We're going to worship. Don't miss that. Um, there's some other people along, but they're not family. Because yeah. there's some places that other poor folks shouldn't be able to come if they're not family. Yeah. 
I wish I could talk to a married couple. Quit letting other folk come in your bedroom. That's your sanctuary. Everybody ought not come up in your sanctuary place. You want to know why your business is in the street? Because you keep letting everybody else come to your place where only certain folk belong. Text helps us understand that, that he says to, to, the, to the service, you all stay here. Me and the boy are going forward. And the Bible suggests that Abraham and Isaac go off together. Please don't miss this. Abraham did not push the responsibility of going with his child off on somebody else. He didn't ask the servants to take him. He didn't send Isaac by himself, but he was present in the life of his son. And I need to tell a cornerstone in here today that it's not enough just to write the check. It's not enough just to get mad at the teacher, but you got to learn to be present in the life of your child. You got to be present at the, at the football game. You got to be present at the parent-teacher conference. You got to be present when they're learning how to drive. But what I'm trying to help somebody understand is we can't pass off the responsibility of our presence on somebody else. Because more than the $100 you can put on their pocket, what your child really wants is your presence. But not only is it Abraham's presence with Isaac, but it's what the cornerstone teaches Isaac about the presence of the Lord. Please don't miss this. They're not on their way to Little Caesars. They're not on their way to Chuck E. Cheese, but they're on their way to worship. You missed that. Let me do it again. Um, The presence that they have is they are going to church together. Daddy didn't send Isaac to church, but he took Isaac to church. And what he's really teaching Isaac is as much as it's good to be in my presence, there is no presence like the Father. When things get thin and runny, I might not be here, but I've got to introduce you to somebody that will always be here. And there's somebody sitting under the sound of my voice. Your earthly father has gone on to glory. You might not even know his name, But you found out that there's another father that'll never leave you nor forsake you. Is there anybody in here that's ever learned about the presence of Jehovah? Has he ever been there with you in the late night hours when nobody else would return your call? Won't the Lord be there when nobody else will? You're going to be the cornerstone of your family? You got to teach your family about the presence of God. But not only that, not only that, please catch this train as it's moving. Text also teaches us that that the cornerstone teaches our children and our families about preparation, patience, and participation. I'm right there in the text. Here it is, Sister Hill. Um, On their way to the mountain, the Bible says that that Abraham chopped some wood and they packed up the wood and they brought a knife and and some flint for fire. Um, um, And they are on their way to where God said, but watch this, Abraham is carrying the knife and the flint, but Isaac is carrying the wood. Um, um, What helps me with that is, is that, that Isaac must participate in the process. Um, um, there's certain things that only Abraham can carry because the knife is dangerous and the flint could cause fire. But, but what Isaac can handle is the wood. And as a part of what God is doing, Abraham teaches him that everybody's got a part to play. Don't worry about it. Come on, I'm coming to get you. When was the last time we made our children have any chores at home? used to be when you got home from school, you had to wash some dishes, you had to pull some weeds, you had to do something, you had to participate in the process. But when we got past mom and daddy's house, we decided we weren't gonna put that on our children. But can I ask you a question? Did chores kill you? Didn't it give you a work ethic? Didn't it teach you to value some stuff? And the problem we have is nobody is making them participate in the process. And I don't blame them because it's our fault that we give them $250 shoes and don't expect them to do anything in return. 
preach yourself happy, Pastor. I think I will. Not only is there preparation, watch what the text says. The text says that they waited three days before they found where the Lord had them to go. Um, um, Abraham is anxious to do what God said. But he can't do it until God says it. Abraham teaches Isaac that even though you live in a microwave generation, you live in a nanosecond uh, uh, generation where things happen at light speed, there's some things that can't be rushed. When God says wait, it's time to wait. And even though I don't like it, and I don't understand it, somebody's got to teach another generation that if you learn to wait on the Lord and be of good courage, he shall, do I have a witness in here that God is worth waiting for? You've got to have patience on your boo thing. You've got to have patience on the right job. You've got to have patience for the right car. Wait a minute, just because you can make the note doesn't mean you can afford it. I'm trying to help somebody. But there's got to be a cornerstone in the house to teach those kinds of lessons. Here's the last thing that this point teaches me. Not only is there participation and preparation and patience. Um, um, at, at, at eight, here was my shout. And, and we get ready to go out of here. Uh, Abraham shows Isaac to be obedient to the things of God. They pack up, they leave, and they go. But Isaac, being the inquisitive child that he does, is ask a great question. He says, Daddy, I'm paraphrasing, I see the wood. I see the knife. And I see the fire. But where's the offering? Because our whole purpose in going to the mountain was to make a burnt offering. I see the makings of a fire, but I don't see nothing to put on fire. And Abraham says, boy, here's my shout right here. The Lord will provide his own sacrifice. And there's there's a cornerstone moment right there that teaches Abraham that even when you don't see God moving, it doesn't mean that God hadn't already handled it. On your way to your situation, God will already provide. Y'all looking at me funny, so let me preach myself happy, Alicia. There have been some times in my life when I didn't know how God was gonna do it, when God was gonna do it, or where God was gonna do it, but I've been with him long enough to know that if he said it, that settles it. One way or another, the Lord will provide. Do I have a witness in here that when you couldn't see your way, the Lord brought some beans and rice and provided a meal. When you couldn't pay your bills, the Lord allowed somehow for all of your ends to meet. When you were on your bed of affliction, and the doctors gave up on you somehow the lord made a way and do i have a witness in here won't he do it won't he bring you out won't he provide shout yeah i got to go that's the cheap shout but shalanda i read a little bit further and i found out that abraham says the Lord will provide. Nevertheless, that's not the end of the story. There's got to be presence. There's got to be patience. There's got to be participation. There's got to be preparation. And there will be provision. But God has to be a priority. Come here, can I show you? When they couldn't find a lamb, the Bible says that Abraham still laid Isaac on the altar, strapped him down, and prepared to sacrifice him. There's some tension in the text for me because human sacrifice was not even something of the people of God. How would God ask him to do something that wasn't even in his will? 
but down the mountain, Abraham said, the Lord will provide. Nevertheless, until he does it, I will obey the Lord. And can I tell you something? Part of the reason God hadn't moved is because we haven't had a nevertheless moment. The Bible says he takes the knife in his hand because he is teaching Isaac that no matter how I feel about it, I've got to honor what God says. I love my family, but God is priority. And as for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. So I don't know what God is doing, but I'm getting ready to honor him. And as he prepares to strike Isaac, the Bible says that an angel cries, Abraham, Abraham, over in the thicket, you will find a ram. Good morning, y'all. May the Lord bless you real good. But if you ever make God your priority, over in the thicket, the thing you've been waiting on, the thing you've been hoping for, the thing you've been praying for is right there when the Lord knows he can trust you. And is there anybody ever experienced that in the last minute of the day, in the last second of the game, won't God show up? Won't he give you what you need? If you make him your priority, he'll make your stuff his priority. Isn't God all right? Give him glory in this place. The cornerstone of the family has to sometimes teach and be a part of tough lessons. Don't you understand? There was nothing in the world that Abraham loved more than Isaac. Yet he was willing to sacrifice what he loved. Which begs this question. What are you holding on to that the Lord can't have? Please, please don't miss this. Because if you miss this, I didn't do my job. Abraham loves Isaac. But he loves God more. Because he won't have another God before him. There's some things we got to release so that Lord, so that the Lord can give it back to us. Amen. Amen. Maybe there's somebody under the sound of my voice. We're not moving. We're, we're listening very quickly. Maybe somebody under the sound of my voice this morning has discovered that you need the cornerstone in your life. I'm not talking about your earthly daddy, but I'm talking about the cornerstone of the church, which is Jesus Christ. How do I accept him? The chief cornerstone. You just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And you shall be saved. Maybe there's somebody else that says, I'm saved, I'm saved, Pastor, but, but I need to give my life back to the Lord. I've been, I've been moving out of the will of the Father. I want to come back home. If that's you, there's an, there's an invitation for you as well. Finally, finally, if there's somebody looking for a church home and the Lord is leading you to Union Branch Baptist Church, we invite you to come. Salvation, recommittal, membership. Is there one? Is there one? Is there one? Look at what the Lord is doing in the house of the Lord on today. Y'all ain't gonna say nothing in here. Oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Is there another? Is there another? Come on, we're praying. We're believing God. He's doing something special in this house. 